All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, tell you a little bit. Uh, well, provide some background first and tell you a little bit about what we've been uh, we've been up to research-wise in these areas. So this is uh, an overview of where I'm going to take you in the talk uh, to start with some background on stress, mood, and alcohol use. Then uh, discuss some resilience factors that can help mitigate uh, these uh, risk factors that result from stress and, and negative mood and affect. I'm going to transition into talking about some uh, interventions, including technology-based interventions, but uh, with an eye toward the uh, adaptability of these interventions to uh, rural individuals who may not have uh, the same type of reliable uh, internet access that others in more densely populated areas have, and uh, and with some formative research that uh, has been led by uh, primarily by two students uh, working with us to move toward a tobacco cessation intervention for, for rural populations. So we know there are strong relationships among uh, stress, mood, and then alcohol use. So uh, we know from longstanding, you know, multiple studies that stress leads to negative mood and that negative mood is associated with alcohol use, and uh, you know a number of folks uh, believe that alcohol uh, you know, reduces or or helps with stress. There can be some short-term reductions in stress due to alcohol, but there's a uh, there's a you know a payment, if you will, or, or negative effects associated with that, and that's been well established as well. And these findings have been fine to apply uh, to individuals in, in rural areas. So both positive, it, it, interesting, people might not think of positive affect motivating uh, alcohol use, but, but it can. Uh, so uh, and we're uh, well aware of the effects of negative affect, of course, on alcohol use. And uh, just briefly, mood versus affect. The idea is that uh, mood is typically longstanding, whereas affect is more of an, an acute result of our, our mood that will, will often lead to behavior one way or the other. So. Uh, while there's evidence relating affect to alcohol use, the, in the research, uh, there have been some weak and inconsistent associations at the daily level among uh, researchers who've asked folks uh, these kinds of questions on a, a daily basis. So uh, one possible explanation for that is individual differences in how people respond to mood. And so one, one thought about this that has uh, research backing is a construct called urgency may have something to do with it. So uh, folks who are characterized by negative urgency tend to react in a, a strong way, uh, in a strong and impulsive way to negative affect. And by impulsive, we mean to act quickly without full regard for negative, negative consequences. So there's thought that response to mood may differ by one's level of urgency, and this may help to explain uh, some of these differences, uh, some of these inconsistent associations we've, we've seen at the daily level. So these are data from a randomized controlled trial we did of a medication called naltrexone that I'll talk about a little more uh, a little bit later. Uh, these were among heavy drinking young adults who did not come in with a motivation to reduce drinking. So we actually did some daily assessments in this study. And uh, what this, this figure means, uh, long and short of it, is that those who had higher urgency, again, this tendency to react impulsively uh, when they're facing negative, uh, negative affect, they were the ones driving a relationship between negative affect on a daily level and drinking to uh, intoxicating levels. So again, some thought of uh, some evidence that there, this urgency factor may be important in these relationships between mood and affect and alcohol use. So of course, not everyone who faces a risk factor will end up uh, drinking more or facing other negative outcomes. So resilience factors are important to uh, to keep in mind in terms of mitigating these uh, these risks. And there's been a number of uh, studies on a variety of resilience factors, including strong family relationships. Uh, religiosity, spirituality, uh, having stronger coping skills, uh, use of mindfulness techniques, and we had a recent paper uh, paper on that. Uh, but one that I've been particularly interested in is protective behavioral strategies. So these are our cognitive behavioral strategies. Colloquially, colloquially we refer to these as, as tips. So uh, different tips we can give uh, participants, patients, clients, uh, to help them reduce alcohol use and negative consequences. 
So a concept that we had gotten interested in is two basic types of protective behavioral strategies, some that relate uh, directly to alcohol use, really that get at the nuts and bolts of how someone of how someone drinks. So tips that people can implement directly to, to drink less, such as counting their drinks, setting a limit beforehand, spacing out uh, drinks, and then indirect strategies. So these are uh, ancillary behaviors that don't relate again to the nuts and bolts of how someone drinks, but sort of, uh, if you will, peripheral behaviors that can help someone avoid, uh, avoid negative consequences. And this is not uh, from intervention research. This is uh, survey and baseline data just showing that the more uh, one uses these uh, direct strategies, uh, this is based on self-report, uh, people who self-report more use of these strategies tend to drink less, and then people who use more of those indirect strategies tend to have fewer consequences, but these don't relate to uh, alcohol use uh, directly. So some uniqueness between the two different types of strategies. So some strategies, though, are potentially harder to implement than others. So you might be thinking with these direct strategies, well, this is where we should be going uh, with interventions. And I agree, we should address them in, in interventions. But uh, they're awfully hard to change, and uh, and why is that? Well, alcohol uh, is immediately available and uh, and rewarding, and uh, there's also uh, dovetailing with individual differences and in tendency to favor immediate rewards. So again, impulse. So people who are uh, impulsive are more likely to uh, drink more often and, and heavily. So they're at particular risk with regard to a substance or a stimulus like alcohol that's immediately available and rewarding. And there are a number of theories that have directed uh, attention on the impact of immediately rewarding um, uh, stimuli, behavioral economics being one. Uh, so for those reasons, slowing the pace of alcohol drinking is, is not, a hard, not an easy thing to accomplish. So we did a, uh, an intervention study around these lines, thinking about this uh, your real, realism that what we can do, especially in a very brief intervention, which is what we did here, uh, it might be it might be challenging to limit those direct strategies and, and thinking that we might actually have more luck focusing on the indirect strategies. So to back up a bit, this study, uh, we implemented a version of a, a very brief web-based intervention called Thrive. So it's based on motivational interviewing uh, principles with which many on the on the call here are probably familiar with. Uh, it's a non-judgmental uh, approach to try to marshal the individual's own uh, interests in behavior change and personal resources for, uh, for behavior change. Uh, so we can't truly do MI in a very brief uh, web-based intervention, but it's based on those, on those principles. Uh, this was developed in Australia and New Zealand, and they did three large uh, trials to support its efficacy. So it has great di dissemination potential for a few different reasons. One, it's very brief. Uh, it takes less than 10 minutes to do. It takes a little bit longer when researchers like, uh, like myself add uh, a lot of different questionnaires because we're always different interested in learning about mechanisms underlying intervention effects. But when you strip, you strip those away, uh, it's particularly brief. So uh, the developers, the original developers of uh, creators of Thrive at all, Kipri and colleagues, are uh, a very generous individuals. So they make the files for the intervention freely available. Uh, so therefore, it's adaptable across populations, and that's important because the, of the current lack of utilization of uh, empirically based uh, interventions. So we took Thrive and altered it to fit uh, American college students, uh, switched out their uh, slang and. and and normative behavior for ours, and uh, subbed in our uh, information about local laws, available resources. So we did a small study at uh, a college, a little over 200 participants, and we randomized uh, individuals to uh, a control condition, which was just standardized education about alcohol and assessment. Uh, we randomized participants to the control condition or one of three variants of, uh, of Thrive, uh, that I'll, I'll talk about a little more in a moment, and uh, we follow up, followed up with folks twice. So this is what Thrive looks like. This is uh, it provides personalized feedback based on uh, a short battery of questionnaires that a participant uh, fills out. So this is feedback based on uh, a measure called the audit. Uh, it gives normative feedback comparing one's own alcohol use to uh, norms among one's uh, one's peers. Uh, the idea here is that. 
uh, things being equal, people tend to uh, believe that their peers act uh, like them, more or less, and that definitely applies in the alcohol realm. So people who uh, drink alcohol at high levels tend to believe their peers uh, do so. That tends not to be the case. So this information, uh, this provides them with that information. We hope that this might uh, create in the MI lingo a discrepancy between one's actual uh, and uh, wished for uh, preferred state of affairs, and we hope that that discrepancy will spur on some behavior change. So to go back to this idea of protective behavioral strategies, it's commonly viewed in the field as an efficacious intervention component, but we haven't paid a lot of attention to how they're, they're delivered. And prior, the few prior studies that have tried to do so have had mixed results. And one reason uh, we think is this, we just give too darn many strategies to folks and it just gets to be overwhelming. Uh, there's one uh, trial in particular that, that presented over 20 strategies to uh, potential strategies uh, to, to alcohol, uh, folks using alcohol and just felt that might be a little too much, a little too overwhelming. So a unique aspect to this study is we, we came up with uh, short groups of strategies, again, direct and indirect, and we randomized uh, some participants to get the full version of Thrive that had included both types of strategies. And then we, uh, we randomized one group to get the direct strategies only and another group to get the indirect strategies only. And to our knowledge, this is the only study that's randomized participants uh, to receive particular types of protective behavioral strategies. Usually everyone gets everything in, in, uh, as far as strategies in, in these types of studies. So our hypothesis, again, a very brief intervention is that we might do better uh, directing uh, our attention at the indirect strategies because the direct strategies are difficult to, to implement. We probably need more than uh, nine, 10 minutes of folks' time in a web-based intervention to accomplish that. So this is what the uh, strategies look like in Thrive. There's kind of a catchy title to it, such as Flock Together, and then a brief description of what the strategy means. So long and short of it is that our hypothesis was confirmed. So uh, participants who received the full version of the intervention that contained both types of strategies had significant reductions in overall other uh, overall weekly drinking. And uh, same with those who received the indirect strategies. Uh, those who received the direct uh, did not show uh, significant uh, advantages over the control condition. And we found similar uh, reductions for uh, the number of, uh, of drinks that one reports consuming on their, on their heaviest day in the past 30 days. So this, uh, the prior work in Australia and New Zealand and this study focused on, uh, on college students and, and they are a population in need, so that is appropriate, but we're looking to extend Thrive out beyond just college students. And one way we're doing that is inclusion in uh, an ongoing study uh, we have to develop a multi-component mobile intervention to reduce alcohol use and prevent HIV among uh, young adult men. So uh, there are strong relationships between alcohol and sexual health behavior, uh, a couple of different ways. For folks who are HIV positive, we know that the more they drink, the less likely they are to be adherent with their antiretroviral therapy, which is extremely important to their health outcomes. Uh, taking the HIV uh, piece out of it, we know that the more one drinks, uh, the more likely they are to engage in uh, suboptimal uh, protective behaviors in terms of their uh, their sexual activity. So they're they're uh, less likely to use condoms, for instance. Uh, so for those reasons, we focused on this uh, interface between alcohol and sexual health. Uh, we also have as a component of this intervention pre-exposure prophylaxis, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with. It's a preventive medication among those at risk uh, to prevent HIV. It's highly efficacious, but uh, not enough people take it, and when they do take it, they don't tend to be optimally adherent. So uh, that's one uh, goal of this intervention is to uh, in increase that in adherence. And as you'll see, as I described this, we develop, we're developing this intervention specifically to make it amenable to rural as well as uh, urban and uh, suburban uh, residents. There's been, uh, there never seems to be enough, uh, right? But there's been uh, a bit more attention recently on the notion of, uh, of HIV as uh, being a particular risk in, in rural areas. So we wanted to be mindful of that. Uh, among the, uh, the states in the South, uh, HIV is, uh, is a real issue. And uh, in a recent study, the nine, nine studies in the South uh, that had uh, spikes 
or continuing issues with HIV incidents, uh, incidents in rural areas was, was found to be an issue in all of those states. So, so it is a problem. So uh, in terms of the implement, implementation of web-based intervention as part of this intervention, so I mentioned we're in the development stage here. So we, we met with 24 members of the study population, had them take uh, the web-based components of uh, the intervention, including Thrive, uh, and get some, got some positive feedback on Thrive. The people found it to be uh, easy to use. They liked the appearance of it, and they liked the personalized feedback. And we believe strongly in that personalized feedback uh, that Thrive provides. Again, that was the, uh, the image with the circle there, the audit uh, measure that I told you about. In general, uh, you know, people are interested in, in themselves, uh, and not to make people sound narcissistic, uh, but it's, it's normal to be interested in yourself. So if information can be, again, delivered in a non-judgmental way akin to uh, motivational interviewing, it's something we believe uh, strongly in. So given the focus of this study on both alcohol and sexual health, we're combining Thrive with other uh, web-based components. So we're combining it with a, a web-based intervention to get at the uh, interface between alcohol uh, and sexual health behavior that uh, my collaborator, Melissa Lewis, developed. And uh, we've also taken, uh, we, we, didn't, we couldn't find a very brief uh, web-based intervention that was focused squarely on sexual health behavior. So we took a module of an efficacious counseling intervention and we basically made a very brief uh, web-based intervention based on that. And because these are one-time interventions, so they are on a computer, one does need internet access, but these are all one-time interventions. So while uh, many folks who, uh, not just in rural areas, who have challenges in terms of socioeconomic status, uh, tend to not have regular access to the internet, and that unfortunately has been made very apparent in our, our current COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, but the vast, vast majority of folks who, who can have socioeconomic challenges, including rural individuals, the vast majority of folks have at least intermittent access to uh, a computer with internet, be it at uh, a friend or relatives, be it at a public library. So we do feel confident in using uh, technology-based interventions as long as they're, uh, including with rural folks, as long as they're, uh, they require intermittent access to, uh, to the internet. Uh, but this strength in that it's one time and it's accessible is a is a limitation in a sense as well, and that people need uh, tend to need more help. Uh, so one solution that we're trying out with this is an interactive voice response system. So this is a telephone-based system, uh, the good old-fashioned uh, telephone, our old friend, right? Uh, so it calls individuals automatically each day. Um, multiple times per day and a, and a researcher, or you know, we feel that this is something that can definitely be scaled to, uh, to clinical uh, situations. So a clinician uh, could automatically set how many uh, automatic, uh, could, excuse, could set how many automatic calls are made each day. Uh, if uh, the individual misses those calls, they can return the call as well. And they take a very brief assessment one could uh, focus these on really any behavior, uh, smoking, healthy eating. Uh, again, given the focus of our study, our questions are on alcohol and other su uh, substance use, sexual health behavior, and adherence to medication. Uh, again, we're in the development stage, but our goal is to ramp this up and include use of, uh, of that preventive medication, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And, and given our focus on adherence, uh, we're really keen to learn if people have taken their medication or not. So why the phone with all of this modern, exciting new technology? Why it seems like we're going backwards with the phone, right? Well, at the time that we were, uh, you know, initially uh, pitching this idea and putting this grant together, uh, telephone-based approaches had favorable medication adherence findings. And actually, uh, this may have changed more recently. Uh, to be honest, I haven't followed this part of the literature. But fancier text messaging-based uh, interventions didn't have strong evidence for uh, adherence efficacy at that point. And this is not just in my areas of substance use and sexual health. This is adherence to medication generally. So that's one reason why we were interested in this phone-based approach. There's also evidence for its utility in reducing alcohol use to inform that kind of personalized feedback I've been telling you about. Uh, there's evidence for efficacy for uh, alcohol when combined with uh, an actual in-person motivational interview. And novelty. Uh, to our knowledge, no one has used this type of phone-based uh, brief system to enhance adherence to pre-exposure prophylaxis. And again, this is amenable to rural individuals and others with limited internet access because and, or uh, data. 
And I think that's something we don't often give a lot of uh, thought to as we are emboldened by the uh, high percentages of, of folks who have a smartphone. Uh, and that's a good thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have uh, you know, big amounts of data. A lot of folks, especially those who are, again, challenged SES-wise, have limited data on a data plan on their phone. And uh, you know, they might not want to use it for health-related purposes, those, those limited data. Uh, there are also, from my collaborator, uh, Jaylee Tucker, there is evidence of uh, utility of IVR uh, approaches, these phone-based approaches, uh, among rural populations. So, uh, so for all those reasons, that's why we thought it might be a favorable way to go. Uh, this is the feedback that we have uh, produced based on uh, participants' uh, responses to these assessments. So at this point, uh, you know, nothing fancy, but gets the job done. Fancy may come in, uh, in subsequent studies. So uh, we had 10 members of the study population, again, at, at the development stages uh, here, take this uh, IVR, use it for 30 days, and got really positive results from it. And again, these are from young adults who you don't think of as using the telephone. Anybody who interacts with young adults in any capacity, you're teaching clinically, or if you have teenager, teenager, young adult kids, you'll know they don't like to have phone uh, they don't love to use the phone. They love to text, but don't love to have, uh, they don't love to use the telephone. Uh, but even given that caveat, we got positive um, uh, feedback on this, that it was easy to use. An important feature of these, uh, of, of these types of systems that may not sound like a big deal, but that people are able to uh, cut off the automated voice on the phone and answer a question before the person finishes. That saves kind of valuable time each day and even saving you know, a second or two per question, it makes the whole process more efficient. And if it's more efficient, if it takes less time, people are more likely to continue to use it. Um, and people like that it raised their awareness of, uh, of their daily activities. So that's, that's definitely what we had in mind. So that's, uh, that's good to hear. And they like the continuity of the feedback they got from the web-based portions and the IVR uh, portion. So these are some other uh, you know, positive notes we, uh, we got about it. So this, uh, we're using these components and we're uh, ramping up toward a little bit larger intervention study here, which has been, uh, has been COVID, uh, COVID delayed, but hopefully we'll be able to start that soon. So we think that this uh, you know, phone-based IVR approach might, might help folks who, again, need more uh, assistance, need more help than a one-time intervention, but that doesn't clo entirely close this intervention gap. So there is an inherent limit limitation of separation uh, in space and time between the intervention and the, uh, the relevant behavior. So if you think about these um, uh, motivational interviewing based approaches, whether it be in person or the you know, type of web based approach I've been telling you about, you know, people will take those on, for instance, a Tuesday afternoon, and we expect them to implement uh, what they learn from those interventions on, you know, the subsequent Thursday night. Friday night, Saturday night, and every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night going forward. And there's a gap, or some might say a, a gulf between those two. And so how do we, how do we traverse that, that, uh, that gulf? We, we need more in-the-moment interventions is, is the idea. Again, going back to this idea that alcohol is immediately available and, and rewarding and how difficult it is to implement those direct protective behavioral strategies. So the two main options here are medication or uh, behavioral or, or technology-based in-the-moment interventions. And I'll tell you a little bit about each. So uh, my collaborators and I have done some uh, research around a medication called uh, naltrexone. Uh, it's an opioid antagonist. Uh, given that's the case, it was initially developed for uh, opioids, but it has utility for uh, alcohol as well. Uh, we have some results that it reduces drinks per day and uh, days where folks drink to uh, the uh, legal BAC limit or higher. And uh, why does it have official effects? Well, in part because it decreases the positive reinforcing effects of alcohol and, and slows relate rate of drinking. So we believe it, it reduces that alcohol-related reward. So to go back to uh, those findings with urgency, and I was saying that uh, uh, urgency seems to be a key uh, individual risk factor in, in strengthening that link between negative affect and, and drinking. Uh, we found here in the same randomized trial that naltrexone had efficacy for folks who are both high and low on urgency. So uh, a possible, possibility of mitigating that, uh, that risk factor there. So it has, uh, it has some promise. It's also uh, underutilized, and we can talk about why if that's of interest to folks. 
So medication um, is something we believe in. It has uh, it has value, uh, but it's not for everyone. Uh, some folks aren't interested in taking a medication, and some who do might still want uh, additional help, which makes makes perfect sense. So technology is with us all the time, and therefore it has intervention uh, has intervention potential. Uh, in my field of uh, the addictions, and particularly in alcohol, it's really been underutilized to this point. Uh, you know, you may think to yourself, well, there's tons of, I can go on the app store and find tons of alcohol-related apps, and you're absolutely correct, uh, but those tend not to be associated with uh, favorable empirical evidence. So the evidence base is really light here. Uh, so we're trying to help uh, do our part to seal this gap. And we decided to focus uh, in one of our initial uh, forays in this area on uh, BAC, blood alcohol content. Why is that? Well, a few different reasons. Uh, it's important, obviously, uh, the higher one, uh, the higher uh, BAC one drinks to, the uh, greater likelihood of all sorts of negative consequences. Uh, there's a real lack of knowledge here, and I'll show you some data to back that up. And again, going back to this difficulty with direct protective behavioral strategies, there have been a number of null studies, mainly older studies, some more recent, uh, teaching older adults who have issues with alcohol to drink to moderate BACs. It's a very difficult thing to teach someone to do. And we do actually have uh, technology to measure, uh, to measure BAC. So more about that in a moment, but now about uh, this, this idea of lack of knowledge about blood alcohol content. So uh, one of my students is doing his dissertation now. We're doing an alcohol uh, lab administration study, and uh, some folks might not realize that you can administer alcohol to people in the lab. You can. Uh, it's certainly a lot harder in the COVID days, and thinking about that is how I spend uh, part of my time these days, how to continue this research, but that's a topic for another time. But uh, basically, he's bringing people into the lab, or had been bringing people into the lab twice, uh, giving them uh, an intoxicating dose of alcohol one session, and then a placebo formulation. Uh, we, we do give placebo alcohol. Again, if people are interested in that, we can talk about how that works. But we do have a placebo alcohol formulation. So we've had very good success in uh, actually reaching the breath alcohol that we're targeting. We, on average, have hit it almost on the nose that we're getting people up to a 0 0.08. Uh, but we asked people, uh, what is the highest BAC that you think you, you uh, reached during this lab session? And people are really all over the place. So in this alcohol session where we're dosing them up to an average of 0 0.08, people think that they reached an average of 0.19. So uh, over, they think they're uh, more than twice the legal limit. And the range is, uh, has been 0.05 to 0.6. If 0.6, if you hit the, that level, you'd most likely be dead. Uh, the person did not die uh, in the study, rest assured. And uh, people are also uh, in the uh, placebo session all over the place. So someone thought they hit a 0.4 BAC, again, possible coma there, uh, from placebo. So uh, we feel there's a lot of potential to uh, help folks to understand uh, BAC. So uh, we do benefit from the fact that there is uh, a, uh, a smartphone breathalyzer device and app that we know yields, uh, with some caveats, uh, yields accurate breath alcohol uh, readings. And that's some information about it on the slide here. That's what it looks like. Uh, this is not to scale. I know everyone's on mute. Sometimes I get a laugh with that, sometimes I, I don't. So. Uh, I'll have to uh, have to guess. Uh, we also had as a component of uh, of this study a BAC estimator app. So as the term estimator implies, there's no actual breath. Uh, uh, bleth, I made a new word. Uh, there's no actual blood or breath alcohol uh, reading produced here. It estimates it based on your sex uh, weight, uh, the type of alcohol you've drank, how many drinks over how much time. And that's what this, uh, this app, the uh, IntelliDrink app, looks like on, on one's phone. So uh, the study that we uh, completed not long ago, we brought in non-treatment-seeking, heavy-drinking young adults. We began them all with uh, a BAC-focused uh, MI-based counseling that we developed, uh, focused explicitly on, uh, on BAC. And then in a lab session, we randomized folks to use one of three forms of technology, uh, either the smartphone breathalyzer device and app, the BAC estimator, or uh, what we had thought of as a control condition. We just taught participants to send themselves uh, a text when they have a drink. And then when you're making subsequent decisions on drinking, just take a look at how many texts you've sent yourself. 
So after the lab session, we had a two week period uh, that we gave participants open access to all three forms of technology. So the randomization ended. They were free to use uh, the technology uh, basically however they'd like for two weeks. And then we followed up with them afterwards. So this is what the sample looked like. Uh, they were basically healthy, but they were frequent, uh, frequent heavy drinkers. So uh, these are the three forms of technology, again, that we used in the study. So a little more about this two week period after the lab session. So uh, again, we provided open access to the technology. Our goal was to learn what people did with these technologies when they had use of them on their, on their own. We paid people $20 just for using each form of the techno technology at least once. So with three technologies, so we paid them for three uses of the technology. So that was it, no other uh, compensation. So the bad news is that, bad news from me, from the scientist's point of view, is that we did not find significant uh, uh, differences in people's alcohol drinking in the lab based on which of the three forms of technology they were assigned to. Uh, but when we brought people back after that two week uh, field period, we found that they were reporting significantly fewer drinks per drinking day compared to baseline. And this is with all within subject, also a lower uh, percent uh, heavy drinking days. And that was, uh, that was significant. So lots of caveats here. This is a short period. It's only two weeks. It's all within subject. I don't have a control uh, condition to match the, uh, this combined uh, experience of using these multiple technologies plus the, the counseling, but we think it's, it's promising. Uh, and people used uh, these technologies way more than they were compensated for. So they were compensated uh, for only three times. They used them on average nine times over the, the two weeks. So again, we think it's, it's promising. Uh, and this is potentially amenable to rural populations because the device were, uh, and app work together based on Bluetooth, not, uh, not internet access. So I want to, uh, for the last part of the talk, uh, tell you a little bit about a project we're doing uh, to develop, a, a, to move toward a web-based tobacco cessation intervention, specifically uh, directed at, at rural smokers. So uh, a number of you, I'm sure, uh, you know, deal with this in your, uh, with your clients, but uh, smoking is, a, is an issue uh, in rural uh, populations. Rural, adult, rural adults are 30% more likely to smoke cigarettes. They have higher uh, cancer mortality rates. Uh, their research participation uh, really remains uh, suboptimal. And this really is, is deleterious on both sides. So uh, the research participants could find uh, useful help to quit smoking from being part of this study. And uh, so, so the participants and patients are, are suffering from this lack of research participation. And science is suffering as well because it's potentially diminishing uh, the validity and generalizability of our studies. So a particular interest in this study are citizen scientists. So these are members of the public who engage with the scientific process that uh, have the potential to be uh, a good resource in terms of getting uh, research findings out there and uh, potentially encouraging uh, participation in research and creating uh, linkages there. Uh, but we don't really know what, uh, what people think of citizen scientists. And uh, our UF uh, CTSI has a number of citizen scientists who, uh, who, work, uh, who work with this center. So we've done two you know, small formative uh, studies here. Well, one uh, done, the other one is actually in, in progress. So uh, this is formative research to examine psychosocial and cultural uh, factors underlying rural tobacco users' willingness to participate in studies. It's theoretical ground, theoretically grounded. And uh, what we wanted to learn about is rural adults' uh, perceived barriers and, and motivations toward research. So in-depth interviews were done with 16 uh, rural tobacco users and two students, Rachel Damiano and, and uh, excuse me, Damiani and, and Neo Gebru uh, really drove this along with uh, Janice Krieger uh, from uh, Journalism and Communications, who's also mentoring the students. But they, uh, they uh, did the hard work in terms of pounding the pavement and making these uh, interviews happen. And uh, we want to thank uh, IFAS Extension for uh, their help in connecting us to these, uh, these participants and other uh, forms of advertising were used as well. So uh, a semi-structured interview protocol uh, was used to get at these attitudes and, and message delivery preferences. So in terms of preliminary findings, there are three types of motivations to potentially participate in research. One is uh, motivation to help others, so altruism. Uh, motivation to help oneself, which is perfectly understandable, 
and then uh, and then financial incentives, which are uh, you know of course uh, important uh, you know, to get individuals in in the door and to compensate them for their their time, especially when we're trying to learn about the interventions. Of course, we we want to think about ways to transition uh, away from compensation sensation since it can be uh, hard if not impossible to sustain. Some other themes are were that citizen scientists were perceived as relatable interpreters of in, uh, scientific information. There was some concern that they weren't uh, experts in the same sense as say a physician or a, a researcher. Uh, and the uh, view of researchers was I guess something of a, a mixed bag. Uh, there was belief that uh, that we do work toward positive change but we're uh, perceived as as distant, and this is socially distant before uh, this is before COVID times. So a different sense of socially distant, which I think is a probably a fair critique of my uh, colleagues and and myself. So now in study two, uh, we're developing and taking initial steps to develop and and test the the intervention. So incorporating feed, incorporating feedback from study one. Uh, we're doing uh, an experimental uh, based approach to get feedback uh, on different types of uh, messages that may be used in this uh, in this intervention. So this is a sample uh, recruitment message. And uh, what we want to do is compare participants intention to participate uh, based on uh, different recruitment messages that they receive. So highlighting these different motivations. So this is really an example of where formative research can lead directly to uh, to subsequent studies and how it's really just critically uh, important to talk to members of the study population. So we're looking at different types of messages and then who delivers the message, whether it's uh, uh, put forward as, <coughs> excuse me, coming from a citizen scientist or from a, uh, a clinician or, or researcher expert. So I had some themes, uh, other themes so far in terms of reasons for beginning tobacco use that we're hearing from rural individuals or that initially it was to seem cool. Uh, peers and, and family members used it and they didn't understand the health risk. But, but interestingly, we, interestingly and, and, and sadly, we've also heard that you know, these peer contingencies have, uh, have dropped off. So now a lot of smokers feel isolated, that they're one of the few smokers that they, uh, that they know. It's obviously harder to find just space to, uh, to smoke and they feel more ostracized, whereas they, uh, they felt more of a, uh, a sense of belonging from smoking. Um, so, uh, belief that, that smoking helps to, uh, deal with stressors, back to that theme of, of stress, uh, lack of alternative stress relieving activities. So, and this is a particular challenge, uh, it can be a challenge for many different folks, but particularly those in rural areas, uh, lack of motivation and wanting to quit, uh, boredom. And uh, so these interviews were done before COVID-19, but boredom is a particular issue now. And this might seem like a, a trite sounding issue with all of the other risk factors that contribute to addictive behaviors. But boredom is a real issue. Uh, a lot of uh, individuals who have issues with substance will report that. So it's something that, uh, again, at first blush, it may sound trite, but it's something that, that we should attend to. And uh, like I was mentioning before, folks finding it, you know, uh, not surprisingly hard to stop smoking. In terms of barriers we've heard about, so like lack of access to care, uh, lack of consistent doctor-patient -pa doctor relationships, uh, lack of ample time with a doctor. And again, this is where peer delivery uh, is something that we really need to look into. Uh, frustration of being told to quit, not as much being told, but often the, the tone uh, with it. And just again, along with this theme of having difficulty stopping, just feeling, feeling trapped. Uh, mainly got favorable thoughts about, uh, about research, that people are generally open to it, although again, there are those barriers. And as always uh, with rural uh, populations, we want to be mindful about access to the internet and, and potentially make use of technology, but in a way that's, that's amenable to folks whose access is a little less uh, consistent. Uh, liter literacy concerns, just making uh, messages uh, and information is, uh, I don't think this is a word, but as unwordy as, <laughs> as possible and as straightforward as possible. And uh, you know, openness to engaging, which is promising, and and altruism. Uh, you know, a lot of times in research, we we think, okay, well, what type of uh, compensation for uh, do we give participants from the study? And compensation is often uh, an important piece. But there is altruism, altruism out there. There is willingness to to help. Um, so in terms of preferences with message delivery, uh, again, straightforward, clear, large fonts. 
uh, possible addition of videos. I have a colleague who has uh, started to work with that in terms of web-based surveys to integrate uh, videos uh, for that. Uh, not too many ads. People don't love pop-up ads, not surprisingly. Uh, avoiding personal information up front. Again, downloadable features. Uh, again, going back to this theme of not requiring consistent uh, internet access and customization of experience. So to wrap things up with the, the themes that we've discussed, so stress, stress leads to negative mood and has an impact on alcohol use. Uh, can be direct in some cases, but we talked about at least one uh, individual difference factor of negative urgency of how uh, quickly and impulsively people react to that negative mood and affect as having uh, an impact. Uh, but these risk factors can be mitigated by resilience factors. Uh, potentially, uh, these resilience factors can be uh, you know, buttressed by interventions. And it's just critically important to get input from study populations. And not only is it important in informing our uh, interventions, but it's something just personally as a, a researcher I've really, uh, I've really enjoyed doing. Uh, for one reason, I don't know if it means I'm uh, you know, a, a sadist in some ways. I even enjoy hearing about aspects of the interventions that, that members of the study population don't like. Like, what else don't you like? Uh, so uh, I want to uh, give acknowledge, uh, acknowledgments to the funding and all the people who have made this work possible. And as far as extension, uh, Heidi Radunovich has been really helpful in terms of connecting this to potential uh, participants for that formative tobacco research we talked about. And uh, that's all I have. So, uh, Happy to, uh, to take any questions. I think I stuck with the time, even though I you know, prepared way too many slides as most of us do. So thanks for your uh, attention, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Lehman. Um, yeah, so as, as he stated at this time, um, we have about 15 minutes or so to take some questions, some comments. You can use the chat box uh, to type those in. We'll give y'all um, just a couple minutes uh, if you're thinking of them. Um, but I know a lot of things were mentioned um, to, to think about and relevance to, to rural communities and, um, you know, I've even been thinking about some relationships of, you know, our current times with COVID-19, which I know you touched on, uh, Dr. Lehman as well. So, um, yeah, we'll give you all just a couple minutes to, if, if you have any questions or comments, just type them in the chat box. Should I stop my share, Philip, or does it matter? Or... You know what, I, I can go ahead and, um, I'll, I'll pull back up my PowerPoint um, okay. right now. Yep. So while we wait just a couple minutes um, more to see if anyone has any questions or comments, um, I just wanted to, to pose something, you know, given kind of the, um, and, I, and I touched on it when I was just a couple of moments ago, but given these extreme times, right, given the, the different times we're in right now, um, while you may not have current research to speak on this, but do you foresee um, in, uh, you know, risky behaviors or, you know, substance misuse, um, you know, potentially spiking during this times of um, lack of community and, and kind of uh, social distancing, you know, does, how does COVID-19 play into this in rural communities as, as well as the general public? That's, that was, that's kind of something I was thinking about. Um, and I, and I know with some of these um, technology-based interventions are very applicable. Um, as well, but um, kind of what's your general thought on that? Yeah, so uh, given that we're still in the in the midst of COVID, the research is is limited, but there has been some limited uh, some limited research that it's more or less a, uh, a 
well, so that as you would expect, it's a, a grouping of people who whose alcohol use has remained about the same. I think it was about, at least in this one study, about 40% uh, remaining the same. And then with the rest of the, the other 60%, it was basically a binary distribution with people, uh, half of those folks increasing their use and half decreasing. And, and thought about the decrease, maybe access, uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> given the financial uh, challenges with the pandemic, not having the money for, for alcohol. But uh, again, in this limited research, I've, I've seen about 30% um, increasing in this one study anyway, which is, which is considerable and there are negative impacts from that. So interesting, uh, the, uh, the smartphone breathalyzer device and app that I mentioned, uh, like many apps, there is uh, there's non-identifiable data that the app sends to the company. Well, we hope it. They say it's non-identifiable. We hope it is right. Uh, but uh, the app sends information to the company Backtrack that um, that's developed the product, and they actually have on their uh, on their website a report about alcohol use uh, before and after the uh, the pandemic, and uh, they did it state by state. And uh, uh, Florida was an example of uh, a state where uh, there's been increase, at least based on use of this device, uh, increased levels of alcohol use during the pandemic. Now, this is not you know a representative study by by any means. These are folks who are self selecting the technology and self selecting when they uh, when they use it, but uh, yeah, potentially interesting anyway.